Let's talk about how I became a video game feminist. Here we go. So over the life of this show, you might have noticed that I come back to the same types of issues again and again. It could be race or sexuality, but the one that is often the most charged is gender. And from time to time, I get commenters who say stuff like, I liked Game Show when he just talked about video games. Not any of this social justice stuff. But here's the rub. Games are not a separate part of our existence. They're a product of our time, place, and culture, wherever that may be. No medium transcends its context, not even video Video games as much as I would like them to. So sometimes they reflect amazing aspects of our culture, and sometimes, intentional or not, they reinforce some of its flaws. And this means games are part of one of the most pointed, contentious, and important movements of the last 100 years, assuring women a place alongside men in every conversation. This may be hard to accept. Sometimes you likely feel helpless or under attack. Sometimes it feels impossible to both love games and be critical of them. But that's what it means to be a critic of games and hopefully a game show viewer as well. To be able to look at the medium we love and ask really hard questions like how we can be better at treating women equally in the world of games. Besides, talking about gender has been really important to us at Game Show. I mean, we want a telly for it. But today, I wanted to give you a little more context for why I talk about gender and the role of women in the world of games, or put another way, how I became a video game feminist. A little bit of background. Back in 2008, I rediscovered video games. They had been a big part of my life as a teen, whiling away countless hours playing Quake in my school's computer lab. When I got to college, it was pretty much all Smash Brothers with friends on the N64, which I've talked about before. Then I just stopped playing. I'm not really sure why. Maybe it was a lack of easily available friends to play with. Maybe I was just 22 and trying really hard to grow up. And if I hadn't decided to start covering games at the Wall Street Journal, I might not have returned at all. This new world of games was exciting to me, and it was an amazing time for games writ large. You had big marquee titles like Bioshock and Assassin's Creed that were opening up new destinations, and you had smaller titles like Braid and Flower that were doing brave, experimental things. I then started interviewing game designers like Hideo Kojima and reviewing games in the Wall Street Journal for my own well, short-lived column. And as I got deeper, I started spending more time around games and game makers, not just as a consumer, but as a professional journalist. That meant early access to games, closed door interviews, and a lot of industry events. The moment that it first struck me that games had a gender problem was when I watched a very senior male producer grab another female producer's butt at an official company party. I should have done something, but I didn't. I froze up and I'm embarrassed about my inaction to this very day. And that was when I started noticing things about how women were being treated in the world of games because I saw versions of that interaction over and over and over again. There were booth babes at E3. Not that booth babes are particular to the gaming industry, but I remember one for the racing game Dirt who was actually covered in dirt. The gaming industry seemed to have a laser focus aimed at attracting males, straight males to be more specific. The booth babes were designed to exclusively attract male attention even though there are lots of women who have just as deep a passion, just as deep a love of games. If you're thinking that simply because it's mostly men or teenage boys who play games and that's why you see booth babes, etc., you're totally wrong, period. If you want to debate that, we did a whole episode about it. Seriously, right there. At some level, I've probably always been a feminist in the sense that I believe in gender equality, but I wouldn't describe myself as someone who was outspoken. But after all that time being around how games are made, it really dawned on me how big the problem really was. And over the several years that it took for that to sink in, I began to notice a host of new, not so great things about our beloved medium, most of which are pretty obvious if you're a woman who loves games. And after realizing these things, it started to change what I actually wanted to spend time with in games. Games. Women as sex symbols or props start to feel stale, and I started to seek out different experiences with more relatable female leads. Then there's the more implicit stuff that starts to get questioned. When I started covering games, I realized that in some ways I was a minority because I'm not white, but in other ways I'm part of a giant, overwhelming majority because I'm male. When I went to video game events or parties, they're almost exclusively male. I hadn't been around that many guys in a single room since my days at an all male high school. These functions were my interest introduction to privilege. It's much easier to be in that 95% of guys than in the 5% of females. I can't imagine what it would be like to be a woman in that context. Here's the point. 
Privilege isn't a zero-sum game. It depends on context. I was a mixed kid, which has a historical legacy and a burden, but I'm also a man, which makes a lot of things easier. I'm far less likely to experience abuse, and I have a much easier time being taken seriously. The nice shoes are gonna make my feet hurt. The sneakers are the most comfortable, and I've got an 11-hour day coming, but are they gonna take me seriously if I want? These are conversations that happen. And again, that changed how I thought and saw games. I started looking for new voices and to use the platform I had to push different voices to the front. And as it turns out, there's a wealth of writers and game makers trying innovative things as a reflection of this gender imbalance. Folks like Nina Freeman and the girls behind Tampon Run are showing different untold perspectives. And when I read game histories, the contributions of women came right out front. It could be Grace Hopper, the first lady of code, or Corinne Yu, who helped design the Halo engine. It's all there, you just gotta look. I want to be clear that I'm far from perfect. Sexism is something that's bigger than you and me, and we carry biases whether we like it or not. For example, why is 90% of game shows viewership male? Maybe there's some implicit thing that I'm doing to not make the show more welcoming to the millions of female gamers out there. And when researching the show, we don't always do a good job of balancing the voices we draw upon or the characters we highlight on screen. It's also important to know that feminism isn't just one thing or one idea. There are lots of strong and sometimes contradictory voices inside the world of feminism, so you can't just paint it with one big brush. Nor do women need men to save them from the explicit and implicit sexism in the world of games. So not to mention, there are lots of places that you can go to learn more. I'll link to some in the description, including this great video from Jessica Lee about how you can be an ally. At the end of the day, I believe that it's entirely possible to both love games and want them to be better, to acknowledge that they're not some separate thing from the world, but a way to challenge ourselves and push forward. So I hope this gives you some broader context for why I talk about gender from time to time. Because I mean, come on, it's not really that often. Regardless, I hope that your personal experiences lead you down the same road that I'm on. Maybe we can walk it together. So what do you all think? I know we focused a lot on me and my personal experiences. Thank you for bearing with me. But I'd love to hear from you about your personal experiences with feminism or gender imbalance or whatever that might be. Hash it out in the comments. And if you like what you saw, please subscribe. I'll see you next week. Last week, we talked about choice. And if you have any in games like The Walking Dead and Portal. Let's see what you had to say. Henrik Nygren left an epic comment. I won't be able to respond to all of it, but I'll link to it in the description. Um, Henrik says that this whole question of player agency and uh, player choice is one of the big reasons why he plays Dungeons and Dragons. And that's an interesting example because in Dungeons and Dragons, there is a rule book, but the first rule is that you get to essentially decide your own rules or that the dungeon master gets to decide the rules for each individual game. Unfortunately, computers don't allow for that type of um, creativity, serendipity on the fly. They're bound by the constraints of their systems, but perhaps someday there'll be, you know, some Google-driven neural mind type thing that is a computer system that makes choices on the fly for you, which gives you more open-ended possibilities for gameplay, but not yet. Eric Hernandez left a very, very long comment. We'll link to it in the description, obviously, much like Mr. Nigren. Anyway, Eric had something really smart they said, which is that choice is never truly free, that we're bound by a certain set of historical conditions, so your race or ethnicity or locale is going to determine determine certain types of things for you in terms of what you can and can't do, which does raise this very interesting larger question, which I, I, I uh, broached in the episode, which is whether or not the illusion of choice in games is a uh, very accurate proxy for the illusion of choice that we have in real life. James Worrell has a funny story about playing Fallout 3, specifically that um, James has played Fallout several times and keeps ending up in the same spot. No matter what choices uh, ultimately he makes, he still ends up at the water purifier. Um, it's it's very interesting. If you play you know, even big open uh, world games that have some sort of objective, um, sort of thing, it's kind of like sonar, right? Where you're sort of sending out these beacons over and over again. And then once you keep doing it, you'll start to develop like a better picture of what the actual lay of the land is. But the only way that you do that is by playing these games over and over and over again. So to some extent, this illusion of choice idea um, sort of becomes a bit of a facade once you start to play games over and over again. But uh, most people probably aren't going to play Fallout 3 
multiple times. That's like several hundred hours. But let me know what you report back. Andrew Jones says that this question of player agency really only matters if you're trying to win a game. Whereas if you're just looking for exploration or experience, for example, then these questions don't matter so much. So I was playing Proteus last night and uh, that game has a wide amount of uh, sort of exploration. You can kind of just walk and do things. Um, and a lot of you have echoed an appreciation for the Ralph Waldo Emerson quote that life is a journey, not a destination. The problem is, is that the more open-ended you sort of make these, you know, sort of games, you end up sort of losing the ability, or at least you get critiqued for not making games at all. So a game like Dear Esther or Proteus, for example, are sort of accused of being walking simulators. So it's this interesting conundrum when you remove the sort of like game-like qualities and allow for wider varieties of player choice, all of a sudden people sort of accuse you of not making games anymore. So maybe, I don't know, maybe there'll be some sort of happy future where you can have something like Elite Dangerous or No Man's Sky, which are creating these ostensibly infinite universes, which will, will allow for wide or uh, wide amounts of player choice. Maybe then and only then will we finally be able to reconcile these two sort of poles. But we'll see.